Next time. It's better. I have it positioned better now. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, people out on the interweb. Um, so I'm Diana McEwen. I direct the Metro Region of Thirst or Clean Energy Resource Team at the Great Plains Institute and um, spend a lot of time working on Green Step City and um, actually help put the folk series together. <laughs> so um, welcome to the folks in the room, the bright shiny faces. It's like, what, 50 something degrees in Minneapolis or St. Paul, sorry, across the river. Um, and it's going to be another gorgeous day. I'm pretty sure winter's not coming. So um, that is the good news for today. Um, really happy to have everyone here. Um, just a reminder, in case you're in the wrong room, um, this is Integrating Land and Water Planning for Green Step Cities. It's our workshop. Um, we have a couple of great uh, speakers today to talk about shoreland ordinances and how to incorporate the, um, those things together. Um, we have uh, great great sponsors. Excel Energy is a series sponsor for all of the workshops this year. So thank you so much to Excel Energy of Minnesota. And um, do you want me to talk about the... Are you going to flip it? Oh, oh there it is. So um, in addition today, I, I want to get out of the way so they can see this. Um, we have our um, lovely uh, Green Corps member, Maddie Norgard, who is um, serving with the Great Plains Institute this year. Um, and she is putting out um, a request for proposal for uh, assistance that she can provide to cities for um, with energy efficiency implementation in public buildings. So um, it includes identifying technical and financial resources, facilitating project implementation, and measuring the progress that results of energy efficiency progress. And by measuring progress, I'm thinking she means B3 benchmarking. I'm just guessing. Um, so all local governments in the 11 county metro region, sorry, Greater Minnesota peeps, um, all local governments in the 11 county metro region are eligible. Um, you can contact her. We do have some handouts, I believe, on the back table if you're interested. Um, she is here to help. That's why she's here, and we really want to um, get her out um, helping uh, cities so that you can get further um, along in the Green Step steps. Best practices. Um, hashtag for any, anybody, a Twitter person besides me? Anybody tweet? Oh, I knew it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, hashtag Green Step WK SHP is probably on your agenda as well. If you're, uh, you know, have to tweet something out, some information, it's great. The League of Minnesota Cities um, and other partners from Green Step will retweet that information to get that out to folks to get interested in what's happening. Um, folks can still join my webinar if they're out in the world. Um, so hopefully they'll see it and join us. And I think that's all I have. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would like to introduce my favorite colleague, Brian Ross, <laughs> and he's with, he works with us at the Great Plains Institute and um, works a lot on ordinances with local governments and has a wealth of knowledge, and I will turn it over to Brian. You have the clicker here? Hmm. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, Again, I'm, I'm uh, one of the newbies at uh, Great Plains Institute. I've only been there about uh, eight months, but I've been working with Great Plains for many, many years on a variety of different projects. Um, I spent uh, a lot of time as a land use planner in my own consulting firm, so I did a lot of work on shoreland uh, ordinances and water quality work um, over the years. So uh, when we decided to do this particular workshop, uh, Diana said, I'm not going to staff this. Who's going to staff this? Brian, you staff this. So I'm the one who's uh, up here. And then, and then I thought, well, that's okay, because I know Dan, and I know Suzanne, and they'll just take it away. They'll just do the presentation. This will be easy. And then Dan informed me that, I, no, I had to do a presentation, too. So <laughs> I'm going to do Brian. <laughs> So I'm going to do the kind of introductory stuff and, and, and kind of get through what the workshop is, kind of what we really get, trying to get to, what the um, kind of end point is of all this, because we do have a, a particular ongoing initiative that we want to make sure that we do. Uh, this is not just a solely information, but rather a process that we want to continue to engage cities on, or DNR wants to engage cities on, um, and, and uh, so we're kind of setting the stage for that. Um, so really the kind of the workshop purpose here that we're, we, that we're trying to get to is understanding, of course, the basic relationship between local land use decisions and water quality, and, and, and the, the difference and the, the synergies and sometimes disconnect between water planning and land use planning. 
um, and also understanding the, the, both the synergies um, and the tensions between statewide planning and the goals that are in that versus local planning, which sometimes differs in terms of kind of water quality and land use goals um, that, that, that these two entities um, um, uh, play at. And then finally, we want to kind of use this meeting to kick off uh, this DNR process to develop a sample shoreland ordinance that's really focused a little bit more on urban communities. Um, and this is something that we thought was a particular a benefit for Green Step cities who obviously have an interest in sustainability. Um, those of you who are familiar with, your, with, with the statewide sample ordinance know that it's not always tailored very well to urban communities and the kind of the, the circumstances that you face. And, and Dan is starting a process where he wants to engage directly some urban communities and develop another sample ordinance or a, a side sample ordinance um, that will uh, kind of go with the existing one that hasn't changed since 1999 or something like that, right? Um, so it'll be updated and it, it's an opportunity for you as cities to participate in this and really see that what happens in this sample ordinance um, meets your agenda, kind of meets the needs that you have in your community. So it's really a unique opportunity to participate directly with the NR and shape an outcome that's going to be um, uh, um, another sample ordinance uh, for the shoreland. Um, so our agenda is I'm going to go over kind of the land water connection and talk briefly about what the Green Step Cities um, uh, existing best practices are that focus on the land water connection. Um, uh, my friend Suzanne Reese from DNR is going to talk about the, the DNR's floodplain program and kind of give you a background on that. Um, and then Dan's going to talk about the shoreland ordinance and also about the shoreland ordinance project that he's putting together. So kind of the land water connection is mine. Um, so first I have to ask a question. See this is a poll and if I was really clever I would have actually had an interactive thing that you could have actually seen the, the graph go up and down but I decided not to bother with that. Um, but kind of take a look at this. What is the key to healthy streams, lakes, and rivers? Yeah, five answers. Anybody have any answer? Anybody have any ideas on this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All of the above, right? All of those things, and 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 that's kind of one of the, the issues that we when we talk about the interact intersection of healthy streams, lakes, and rivers is and, and land use planning is that we talk about all these things, which is really what we call the watershed approach, right? Um, we the shoreland ordinance is is kind of a thousand feet from lakes, 300 feet from streams and rivers. Uh, the floodplain ordinance talks about just those areas that are designated as floodplain, but really if we want to talk about water quality and these local resources, we need to think about things at the watershed level. And that's why all of these things are in fact important to help these streams and rivers. So then the question becomes, what is a watershed? And I'm hoping that people have some sense of what that is, but I put it up there anyway. Um, and, and this is one, this is out of a presentation that, that DNR used already. Um, and, and where I think you did have the interactive thing going, and, and uh, I really liked it. Um, I actually was, would have voted for E. You know, I mean, it is kind of the really ultimate old-fashioned toilet, <laughs> the watershed. But do, do people have a sense of, uh, you know, does everybody understand what a watershed is? Because it is, in fact, as people, most people mentioned, an area of land that drains to a common body of water. So it's it's where. So we draw the lines where on one side of the line the water drains one way and on this side of the line it drains this way to a common body of water, whether that be a stream or a lake or a river. Um, and uh, it, it is, it, it, it defines not only, however, we talk about it in watershed and we think about it as where water drains, but in fact it also defines ecosystems, it defines the way the land is shaped. Um, there's, you know, the, the topography is frequently um, both shaped by and shaped the watershed. There's a lot of different things that come into this, and so we talk about watershed functions um, as, a, as a as a hydrologic and, and ecological um, term um, that is more than just where the water drains. Okay, so I, I really like this. Uh, the, uh, I, I asked when they said I had to do the introductory. Uh, um, Talk, I said, well, you're not going to make me actually create a PowerPoint. They said, no, no, we have one for you. So I get to use the cute watershed slides here. So here's the watershed. Um, and and I took a, a Walter reference. So they had to Walter the watershed. So if you want to name this watershed, you could call it Walter. Um, 
but a healthy watershed is one that has free flowing rivers, diverse plants and animals. If the, the water is clean, the banks and, of, of rivers and, and streams are stable. Um, and, a, and something like when rain falls on it, something like 90% of the rainfall is actually infiltrated into the ground or captured by the vegetation that, that is that is on the on the surface of the land, you know, the trees and the plants um, directly. So it, it's 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 really something that, that, we, that has been defined pretty well, and and is in, in that 90% that kind of infiltration or runoff number is really critical to kind of defining what a healthy watershed is that affects all these other things. But over time, as we do development in the community, watersheds begin to change. You things happen that interrupt the flow of the rivers, and and, and there are diversions. Um, trees get cut down or get uh, pushed out for, uh, for uh, kind of habitat reasons or development reasons. There's increasing amounts of chemicals and sediments that get into the water. Um, we see eroding stream banks and soil loss within a, within a watershed that is starting to be impacted by development. Um, and increasingly, kind of one of the reasons for that is, is that rainfall um, tends stops infiltrating so much and tends to run directly into the streams, lakes, and rivers. Um, because there's less vegetation and because there's more impervious surface and those things affect the way the health of the watershed is working. And really when you get to the point as we see in some of our urban areas where the watershed is really not functioning well at all, you have disconnected and blocked waterways, you have significant amounts of vegetation loss or, or you know, when as development goes in, um, water quality dramatically declines, um, you have a lot more erosion and, and we the, most of the rainfall that's, that's, that's hitting the ground is actually going, running over the surface of the ground, whether it be on, on actual uh, you know, turf grass or something, or on um, pavement, the streams, which of course contributes to all these other things that are going wrong in the watershed. And one of our big challenges in cities is how do we do development to make you know, this watershed work the way it's supposed to work? while still also accommodating the needs that we have in our community for development, for housing and jobs and those kinds of things that we need to sustain our communities. So um, the scientific kind of picture of this is, uh, I, I really like this slide. This is an analysis that was done, is this Crow Wing County? Um, in Crow Wing County where the, um, they did an assessment of the risk factors of, for watersheds and they kind of layered them on top of each other. Where is their development pressure? Where is their protected land? Where is their disturbances of various kinds, whether it be development or non-development? How high is the level of impervious surface in the watershed? Um, what are the current and the future land uses um, in terms of kind of where development is going to occur? Um, what are the drainage issues? All this kind of stuff, they look at these risk factors and then they assign it to various watersheds. And you can see the, the red areas were the ones where there was very high risk the green areas are ones where there was very low risk. And this is the kind of analysis um, that kind of really says how we are looking forward, how do we address this um, risk factor in our communities for water quality as we plan for development and, and those areas that are higher at risk require more attention in that development process. And how do we do that then both in our planning and in our regulations? So um, let me just step back here and ask you guys a question again now. What uh, when you do land use development in your community, which of these which of these risk factors do you do you actually consider in your in your existing regulations? Anybody want to volunteer? Have a show of hands. Who here addresses impervious surface in your regulations? Okay, several hands in the air. And do you let me ask? Do you do that just in the shoreland ordinance where it's required? Under the state state statute, or do you do it uniformly across the community? Uniformly, okay. Um, do you think about making sure that there's protected lands in, in your community? Most people say yes because they think of parks and things like that, right? Are there other kinds of functions? Do you do you have conservation easements that you use in your community to protect land? Okay. Um, what about drainage and storage? Water storage. When you when you in your development regulations, is that something that gets addressed? Again, show of hands here. All right. Yes. Good. Um, and I was hoping that nobody was going to answer. You know, E there. Okay, F is all right. If you don't know, but um, 
But these are the kinds of things that, that you, you need to, to address in your land use regulations for watershed health. And the good news is, is that you're already doing some of these things, right? Um, and, and, and so when we talk about watershed health, that this is something that is that, that you're already going down kind of the right path. Um, how does this now local land use planning and, and regulation interact with the state um, uh, and, and federal regulations? We have um, kind of the, the, the cascading effect. Um, we have goals that we've set at the, at the state level by the legislature in our shoreland and floodplain rules. And actually, the floodplain rules even go back to, to FEMA, to, um, to feds. Um, and so those have been created. Um, so the statutes were created. The DNR then created a series of rules for shoreland and floodplain to implement the statute which then cascade down to the local government because that's where they're actually implemented. There's a requirement that every single jurisdiction in the state must have a shoreland ordinance, um, although we know there are some that do not. Um, does, anybody, does anybody not have a shoreland ordinance in their community? Okay, a couple. What if you don't have a shoreland? <laughs> uh, you prob I think you probably do in, 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 terms, of, uh, in terms of streams. I, I, I think even Falcon Heights. I think you might have them. even Falcon yeah. Heights. Really? Yeah. You just you just looked at them. Okay. All right. Well, I, I was thinking you, you still did. So there are a few. Well, if you don't have shoreland, you don't have to have an order. Okay. Guess um, you don't need to be here, for Peter. <laughs> <laughs> so how about wetlands and shoreland? Mm. Uh, wet, wetlands are not covered under the shoreland ordinance unless there are certain okay. classes of wetlands that are. Um, you can have a microphone. They are, we, we designate them if you know, if you remember the old circular 39, uh, that's wetlands that are classified as 4, 5, and 6. Uh, 3, 4, 5. They have, these are the wetlands that have water in them. And then there's other wetland classifications that might be a, sort of a prairie or a woodland wetland where there really isn't um, perpetual water in it, or rarely. And so there's different classifications, and I'll cover a little bit of that. But, but some wetlands definitely have a shoreline classification. Should have a shoreline. And do they have to meet the, the size, the threshold size as well? Yes, there are sizes associated with that, and that varies depending on whether you're a city or a county. Right. So even if it has standing water in it, if it's a small wetland, it may, it may not. Right. Yeah. And it could be under covered on the black coast right. right. But not yeah. as a shoreline. Not as a shoreline. Yeah. So there, it gets complicated. <laughs> and you can ask Dan more about that later. Um, but nevertheless, this is the kind of stuff that local governments have to deal with in their in their actual ordinances when they're writing them and kind of assessing how these things then impact their community. Um, and then kind of the real critical point is this last piece, where you make local development decisions, um, you're actually enforcing and you're you're going through the development process and you're you're doing uh, subdivision reviews and you're doing development reviews, et cetera. And that's really and 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 then also performance standards where you're actually enforcing what people do on their lots. You know when they go in and put in that retaining wall um, on the, in the shoreland buffer area when they weren't supposed to, and things like that. Um, so that's kind of the state process. But simultaneously, we have this other process that happens, some of which is connected to the state process, and some of which is not. You have a local land use planning effort um, where you're you're doing your own community visioning process and saying what do we want to be looking forward in the community? How do we then develop and and, and regulate development and set goals? How do we create our future land use map and our zoning map that connects ultimately to the same kind of development regulations um, that are being impacted by the shoreland area? Okay, our icons here. One of these, these we're all supposed to be going. Okay, there we go. Um, so, and and this is the kind of uh, planning cycle that we see at the local level. Um, here, where you kind of, you know, roughly on the metro area every 10 years, but most communities do it up, about on that cycle, even out in greater Minnesota. Um, you know, you kind of assess what your 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 uh, your background inventories and the like. You set community visioning. You do a comprehensive planning and land use planning, and then you kind of implement that 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 plan over time. And there's a similar process that goes on on the water side, kind of a watershed cycle. Um, there's an assessment. There's um, uh, characterization and, and assessment, there's strategy development, there's a watershed plan that's put in place, and then there's ongoing implementation of that. And the difficulty and the tricky part is, is how do we do the integration of these two processes in a way that makes sense so that we're maximizing 
and achieving the goals both of the local community and at the state level at kind of the resource level, which is the water level. So um, the different entities that are doing all this work, we have kind of these different silos that exist. We have shoreland, which of course is 1,000 feet from, from shoreland of lakes and 300 feet from rivers and streams. Um, it's a designated area that is regulated by the state statute. We have floodplains, which includes flood bridge and flood waves. It's generally the, that's pretty much the 100-year floodplain, right? I characterize my right, Suzanne, um, which is starts, which is uh, defined by at the federal level and then implemented and, and managed by the state. We have watersheds that do get planning done, and it's usually done by watershed districts or watershed management organizations. And then we have political jurisdictions as well that are doing water planning or land use planning. Um, county water plans, counties have responsibility across the state for doing water plans. Uh, soil and water conservation districts sometimes are the same entity doing that plan, but sometimes it's different, and they do a lot of programs around water quality and land use and uh, encouraging proper land use um, uh, um, use and development techniques and, of course, city zoning um, and county zoning, but we're talking mainly to cities here. Uh, so we have these different jurisdictions. The related areas that they cover are distinct, right? I mean, they overlap. The shoreland area overlaps with some extent with the floodplain sometimes. It, over, it obviously overlaps with a watershed, but not on a uniform basis. And then, of course, the political jurisdiction may cut through the middle of a watershed. It may even cut through the middle of a shoreland area. So we have different entities that are regulating the same shoreland piece. So we have this kind of confusion of, and, and silos where people are doing their own planning processes rather than working together. So in your planning process, when you do comprehensive planning, do you engage these other entities in that process? We've seen a few nods. Okay. Um, what about in your regulation? When you implement in your zoning, do you also engage all these other parties? Who, uh, this, uh, who here has a watershed district in their city? Okay. And will somebody volunteer? Just how do you engage the watershed district in your in your regulation? How do, how do you guys interact? Because they have some authority, you have some authority. How does that work? You might want to volunteer. Go ahead. Uh, well, uh, if uh, a resident comes to us that wants to do some uh, work along a bank or a shoreline, uh, we get in contact with the, uh, have them also get in contact with the watershed district, work with them there for and then um, we'll come out sometimes concurrent into doing the inspection um, to make sure that the plan say on a, on a disturbed bank has been confirmed the design um, or first any recommendations. And then if there's enough um, promotion prevention, take the ownership of the design on it and get the deposit back. Okay. So, so you, you actually have a set process by which you're engaging with the watershed district on that particular, or is it, or is it ad hoc? I guess that's my. Kind of ad hoc, because it depends on the site. Okay. Um, sometimes we don't need to get involved, and, and oftentimes we want to just make sure that you know, to simplify things for the residents who want to be more on, like the duck issue at the state fair that moves back and forth and changes direction, but yeah. it's not going to be bumped into the triangle. Okay. All right, so it, 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 there is a process. You kind of worked it out, but it's an ad hoc process rather than one that's been mapped out clearly. Yeah, because, you know, the sites are like that. Okay. I mean, within a certain framework. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, and that's not atypical, I don't think, of, of this. And this is one of the things we want to try to get to in, in, in kind of in the long-range effort is how do we better integrate all these processes together, both at the planning level and at the implementation level. So I... Um, I want to quickly run through kind of what Green Step Cities already says in the best practices about uh, um, this intersection of land use planning and water quality planning. Um, so the, the most obvious place um, is in the best practice 19, which is surface water quality, um, and particularly uh, action number four, which is adopt a shoreland ordinance for all lakes and, 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 and rivers, uh, shoreland areas. Uh, you're required to do this, but as we said, not every community has done it, so we did include it as, a, as an action here. Um, and some of these other uh, actions also kind of have some relationship to land use planning, but this is the kind of the primary one from the regulatory standpoint that we see uh, in Green Step City's best practices. But 
And best practice advisor is your speaker today. Yay. Okay. So he's, he's, he's an asset that you can call on um, afterwards because he's committed to do this through this work, helping, helping Green Step Cities uh, communities with uh, surface water quality best practice. So um, we also have a best practice, right, for comprehensive plans. So this is a, requ a requirement um, under the Green Step Cities program. Um, the number one is a requirement that you must adopt a comprehensive plan, but you know action number three says that to include requirements in the comprehensive plan for intergovernmental coordination addressing things like land use and watershed planning, right? So it's actually another action that you can do and claim credit for, and if you participate in Dan's process here, you'll be able to check the box on another on another action. Um, yes? If any individual can be able to achieve intergovernmental coordination <laughs> That's true. But what but 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 what are added benefits? <laughs> okay, it's icing on the cake. All right. Um, nevertheless, you know, this kind of kind of working with state agencies and, and doing it explicitly is something that we include in Green Step Cities and we encourage through the Green Step Cities process to do that as part of that planning process. Um, and of course the Green Step advisor on this is Suzanne Reese, who's also speaking to you today. So when you have questions about this, you didn't even know that. I, no, I did. I've done oh. one call so far, and it's from a township. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, yes, she's a resource, and, 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 and Suzanne is our floodplain expert today, but she can add, and she's had years and years of experience with comprehensive planning. So, um, another piece that Green Step Cities, obviously, is the stormwater management. And everybody understands the relationship of stormwater management, I think, to water quality. Um, there are several here that explicitly have, have land use components to them that as you think through kind of the material that you're going over today that um, who, who here has actually done gone through the Blue Star City somewhere? Just one community? Okay. That, that's, that's pretty good. That, that's actually a fairly common one that a lot of cities have done, but I really do encourage people to do that. It's a good process. Um, and then, of course, uh, we have adopt by ordinance high level stormwater infiltration management strategies. I sure did a little shorthand there. It's a little bit more detailed than that. It's one that explicitly relates to the implementation end of that of that water quality land use connection. And then the final, um, it's not the final one. We have a, a best practice number ten for conservation design, and this one does not say really explicitly talk about the land use water connection, but it is something that's integrated directly into the shoreland ordinance. Um, and so. Um, the kind of there's a couple different pieces here that relate to that um, water land use connection. Conducting a natural resource inventory and incorporating that into the into the subdivision or development process. This has a watershed function to it. Um, if you do that, if you're in the metro area, you've had the uh, the MLCCS inventory done, and you can use that in your planning process to help guide a lot of kind of watershed function for um, work that you do. Um, adopting a conservation design policy and using a conservation design tool and um, developing and fund conservation easement programs. Remember back to an earlier slide where I talked about protected land as a component of a land use water quality um, strategy. This is kind of the, the set of tools that you can really use to get to that particular piece. And then finally, we have a new best practice that's not been formally announced yet, but it is up on the website. And that's on climate adaption and climate resiliency, best practice number 29. Um, and it is still in draft form. We're still kind of kind of seeing how it works. But we have um, several um, pieces of this that also relate to this uh, land use water quality intersection, um, particularly as it relates to resiliency right, and climate adaptation. Um, preparing to maintain public health and safety during extreme weather and climate change related events. So what does that mean? Think floods, right? And we we know that the whole dynamic around um, stormwater has changed because of climate changes. We're seeing a lot more floods than we used to see. Um, they've had to change all the engineering standards. Uh, who here has gone from? And here, this is the engineering question. Who, who here has stopped using TP14 and is now using Atlas 14? All right, well, somebody actually knows what I'm talking about. A couple of people, good. Um, so you know that that's the kind of thing that, that that's happened that that, that we're is addressed here, but it's really kind of doing this from a resiliency standpoint. And this is a big piece. The one thing that we have, we did note in talking to Suzanne recently was that 
we don't in Green Step Cities have much in the way of floodplain kind of best practices, and this may be something that we need to think about um, in our best practices moving forward. So, okay, I'm about out of time here, so I'm going to not ask you another question there. I'm really going to let the other people talk. But we can go ahead, and our goal here is to kind of make those watersheds healthy again, even in our urban areas, because we can do development and still maintain watershed function. And that's kind of the key message here. And how we do that really depends on this kind of integration of, of land use and water quality planning from both the state side, state and federal side, and, and, um, and the local side, and the other entities that are doing the planning. So I think that's my last slide. Great. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to hand it over to Suzanne. Now. to read, although maybe the people on the uh, WebEx or whatever it is can see it better. But um, I, I've, uh, as Brian said, I spent many years uh, working as a consultant uh, with a focus on comprehensive planning and zoning and uh, joined the DNR around five years ago. And since then, I've had three positions at the DNR, first in parks and trails planning, then uh, working with Dan in the floodplain program and also on the Mississippi River critical area, which some of you know me from and which we're still working on. Um, <laughs> hope to finish that someday. <laughs> and, uh, but about the beginning of this year, I moved to a different position. So I'm not actually working with floodplain ordinances. Well, I still am. I'm trying to wrap up a bunch of things. But um, Matt Bauman, who's our, our new, is our new floodplain shoreland uh, water quality planner in that division. But um, I have, what I, one thing I did do in the floodplain program was to encourage communities, uh, try to streamline our model ordinance process and encourage communities to adopt higher standards. So that's, that's what I'll be talking about. Um, so, why do we have floodplain standards? I'm not, I'm not going to ask you that. I'll just answer it. Um, typically, uh, the whole, and I have to refer to my notes here, um, floodplain management has really historically been about preventing damage to life and property, you know, both to the occupants of the property themselves and to their, their neighbors up and down the street. So you want to prevent damage to your own property, you don't want to cause damage to other properties, and especially you don't want to damage your public infrastructure, much of which is often located in floodplains. Um, so Brian mentioned that was 14. Um, this is the uh, NOAA document that is based upon um, recent decades up to the present of historical rainfall patterns, where the old TP40 came out in the 60s, so of course it was based upon even older rainfall patterns. But um, what Atlas 14 is showing, for example, is that these are changes in the 24-hour, 100-year storm, the rainfall event. Um, so in in central, in the metro area, uh, going from six inches to almost eight inches uh, out in Fargo, going from five inches to over six inches. So it, it varies by state, uh, part of the state. Northern Minnesota is not that affected. Um, but here's the interesting thing, is that the floodplain maps that FEMA produces do not use Atlas 14 in their calculations. They have their own sort of modeling software, and they, some, I guess some of them use gauges and it's kind of a black box to me, but not all of them, most of them do not take the most current data into account. But what we're seeing is, as, as I said, the, you know, the, the minimum, the FEMA maps and the minimum FEMA regulations don't really account for increases in runoff that are due to development. Um, maps are often updated many years after development has taken place, and the precipitation patterns are changing. So we get more intense storms, we get them 
any time between March and November, where the flooding used to happen in the spring. And you mentioned those technical failures. So what does that mean? We're seeing more flooding in areas that perhaps did not, areas that were kind of designed to be resilient to floods. For example, these are trails. This is the Red Jacket Trail and the entrance of the Casey Jones Trail in western Red Jacket is in Mankato. And this, this was in 2010. Uh, and you can see kind of the level of impact happening there. Um, one of the sort of uh, rules of thumb in floodplain management is that you try to uh, focus your, you put open space and parkland in areas where buildings would be damaged or where they could you know, flood risk for others could be increased. Um, we try to keep those areas open for flood water storage and uh, prevent the impacts from higher flows. But you can see those impacts are happening in this slide. Now, um, how many, I'm guessing that all of the communities that are participating in this webinar are part of the participate in the National Flood Insurance Program. If anyone doesn't, does anyone not participate? We'll assume that everyone does. Uh, I think these, these numbers are a couple years old, so they may be a little bit out of date. But um, here's another question that you may not know the answer to. Is our floodplain ordinances mandatory? question. No, they're not. They are mandatory if you want to participate in the National Flood Insurance Program. If you don't, like, let's say you don't have any floodplain or you have hardly any floodplain or you are such a small community that you've never had a need for flood insurance, you do not need to adopt an ordinance. But if you want to participate in the program, you do, and the ordinance then needs to meet both state rules, state rules, state from the state. Uh, so that was the State Flood Plain Management Act. And this is, I, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because I think a lot of you may have seen this already, especially if you've participated in any of the DNR's own uh, floodplain training sessions. And those, those sessions are all day long and will load you with all kinds of technical information about floodplain management. Uh, but the state has a defined role as the coordinator for the program. Uh, we also have our own state rules, um, again, dating from 1969 or 70, which are in many respects more stringent than the federal standards. Um, so here's that series of roles, again, similar to what Brian was showing. Um, really, the role of the city or county or township is most important in terms of adopting the ordinance, enrolling in the program, keeping records. Um, the state is the primary agency, DNR is the primary agency that assists communities in this effort. Um, but watershed districts often have overlapping regulations, some of which are more stringent. Watershed districts often do more detailed modeling of flood elevations and flows, which then can produce better maps. And FEMA, you know, sort of the, the men in black image we used to have that on our slide. Uh, they oversee the flood insurance program and they can they can suspend communities that uh, don't meet the requirements or that don't get their ordinances adopted in time. Um, they approve, they produce the maps, they produce the flood insurance um, studies, and they also fund many of our state activities. So uh, and I'm, I bet everyone knows this. Brian mentioned the flood way, which carries the water up 100, that 100-year 100 or 1 percent chance flood, and the flood fringe, which is adjacent to it. Um, there's another category that's called the general floodplain, where basically what that means is that nobody has done the detailed studies to delineate the floodplain, uh, or nobody has done them on FEMA maps. Somebody will have to do them later. Um, so when do you need to update your ordinances? Typically, it becomes 
it's mandatory when FEMA does countywide map updates. And I see the folks from Anoka County are currently going through that now. I think everyone in Gridley probably hates us by now because the maps changed, as Kay was saying, to put some people in the floodplain that hadn't been in there before to take some other people out. And those people are not happy. And there's a lot of sort of uh, detailed work involved in the ordinance update. Um, but there's also a lot of opportunities for voluntary upgrades. Um, or if you're a new enrollee in the flood insurance program, that's another time when you need to talk to the workers. So, um, and the way it works is uh, FEMA is kind of, they're kind of working their way around the state. Um, um, the brown communities were supposed to be done this year. Uh, most of them will not be. <laughs> uh, but Anoka will be done this year, and let's see, Kenny, Ohi, and Norman, most of the ones that are in the blue, are all now complete. One interesting thing uh, all the light blue counties already have updated maps, and that means that all those communities have relatively updated ordinances which probably still have some room for improvement. Um, you, you see big areas of northern Minnesota that either never were mapped or are not getting new maps. And that's, a, that's simply based upon population density. Uh, at some point, FEMA decided that they could not produce new maps for the entire country, so they're going to focus on areas with more people in them. Um, however, DNR now has much better data even for those areas and can provide that data, uh, what we call base flood elevations. Uh, how many people have heard of LIDAR? Yes, everyone's heard of LIDAR. LIDAR is the new um, light detection and ranging. It's the, the type of aerial photography that gives you extremely precise elevations. And we are able to use that along with our own models to produce better flood data for a lot of other parts of the So these are the things that floodplain ordinances typically regulate. Um, what type of pieces and structures can go in the floodway and the flood fringe? Uh, you're allowed to fill in the flood fringe, which we can now see as kind of a defect in our state rules. Uh, but nonetheless, in fact, you're required to fill if you want to build a flood fringe. Um, we have specific requirements for things like roads and bridges and RV parks and manufactured homes. We have the floodplain ordinances have their own variance standards, which are different from and more stringent than the state variance standards. And same with non conforming standards. Um, when Dan talks about shoreland, there's a fair amount of overlap between them. But floodplain ordinances typically look at quantity of water. They look at elevation of buildings rather than setbacks, where shoreline will focus more on setbacks. And as I said earlier, floodplain tends to focus more on protection of property rather than protection of the natural environment, which is not necessarily the, the highest standard. Um, let me go through these really quickly. There's been a lot of state funding uh, ever since 1987 to um, reduce flood damage and mitigate flood hazards. Um, this complements FEMA funding, which has also been used in areas where disasters have been occurring. Um, you can see mostly bond funding. You can see some big spikes in 2010. There was also a lot of flooding in 2014. But what a lot of these measures are, are structural in nature. Um, so this is Montevideo, uh, and each of those red dots uh, represent a structure that's now been removed from the floodplain. So when it floods, now it floods parkland. But, you know, is this the most cost-effective means of flood protection? No, it would be much more cost-effective to prevent construction in those areas in the first place. Um, but this has been especially well used in the um, Fargo-Moorhead area, the Red River Valley, where flooding is kind of endemic because of the lack of property. And 
where a lot of communities were historically located in the floodplain areas. There were very few other alternatives. Um, but now here's something that will relate to what Dan will talk about in terms of model ordinances. Our floodplain program, unlike the shoreline program, we have fairly up-to-date model ordinances. And if your county, and I'm, I'm looking at Hennepin County, because Hennepin County is going to have new maps. Oh, I don't know, it's been about 10 years in the process, but we're anticipating them maybe next year. Um, when it's your community's, your county's turn to get new maps, we work with each community to provide a sample ordinance that is really tailored to their conditions. You know, what kind of flood zones do they have on mapped areas? Um, do they have streams? Do they have lakes? Um, how restrictive do they want to be? How does it fit with the rest of their code? And so we provide those samples, and it makes it relatively easy to go through the adoption process. Relatively. Um, and we, we comment on variance requests, we comment on conditional use uh, permits, um, which is a high priority, and we promote higher standards. But then most of the work gets done at the local government level. And uh, notice the last bullet, you know, sure, if you're in the program, you need to keep a lot of records, you need to assist homeowners, but are you really recognizing or protecting the ecological functions of what? Um, so what do we mean by higher regulatory standards? Um, first, your standards that recognize those natural beneficial functions. And second, standards that just increase the base level of protection to life and property. Um, this is a highway and county road in Sinley County, and I think this is from 2014, where there was some very intense flooding in southern Minnesota and places metro area, a lot of uh, landslides and bluff uh, failures in this area. So um, there are a lot of good reasons for including some higher standards in the ordinance, um, including saving on flood insurance premiums. Uh, but probably the one that we should concentrate on as the benefits and functions. Um, I'm not going to stop on this one. Well, I would say that Minnesota standards are already higher than FEMA standards. Uh, and we can look at this later, I assume. Um, but there are a lot of things that we address in our state rules that the Code of Federal Regulations does not address. Um, but we also allow a lot of things that your community might not want to allow. Um, our model ordinances say, as our state rules say, yes, you can have commercial and industrial parking lots and floodplains, you can have storage, um, you can you can do you know, you can do filling and flood fringe. Well that may not be appropriate in your community. You don't need to allow all of those conditional uses. Uh, one thing that we've been discouraging lately is uh, R V parks and home parks. You know, people tend to like to put them along rivers and we found out a few years ago that the health department rules uh, did not allow that to happen. So we said, okay, we should probably be consistent. Um, some examples of highly restricted ordinances. Uh, Rosemount, Dodge County, Nicholas County, uh, essentially they had limit the entire floodplain to open space uses, um, you know, recreational uses, yards, uh, existing structures if they're there become non conforming. Uh, Dodge County has a good statement of purpose. They say, well, development area of these areas is not essential to the orderly growth of the county. Um, and these lands are suitable for open space uses. And Nicholas County probably went the furthest. They applied the floodway standards, the floodway standards, the most restrictive standards across the 500 year floodplain, which is not, you know, you don't even need to buy flood insurance for the 500 year flood. Here's a series of slides that show some of the dangers of putting the critical facilities like the hospitals and the nursing homes and even, you know, water treatment plants, well, that makes it work, water treatment plants, or sea or lake water treatment plants, or wells. These are often have to be floodplain, but they need higher levels of protection. Um, this was a sort of landmark situation in Rochester where people actually died in the flood because 
there was no access to the site. Um, this is an example for Oatana where some of their, well, we'll get back to that in a minute. And then this was a big one outside of Minnesota. Brian recognizes this, I'm sure, that people laugh at where What were these buildings? There was a jail and a county building, I think, that was this island in the river. And county courthouse. County courthouse. The city hall actually was out there. Yeah. So, and uh, yeah, all the county offices were flooded. They had to move to a shopping mall. This was, this was a, a major, major moment in 2000. The third most expensive cause of the history of the nation. And that's the Cedar River, isn't it, which starts in Minnesota? Minnesota. Yeah. Um, so one of, I guess, the, the lesson is it is possible to restrict or prohibit uh, uses such as hospitals, prisons, schools, daycare, you know, fire and police stations. As I said, some of the water uh, treatment facilities may have to be in the floodplain, but there are other ways of structurally protecting them. But these other uses do not have to be there. In fact, we, we put this provision into our model ordinances optional provision of the program. Uh, this was the situation in Owatonna where their uh, well houses actually were flooded even though they had already been elevated in 2010 to the standard which is a foot above the 100 year flood level based flood elevation. They already been elevated but then they were and now they've been elevated to two feet above that level, which is kind of an indication of the type of extreme floods that we've been getting in southern Minnesota. Um, something that Wisconsin does that is actually more restrictive than what Minnesota does is they, they manage land use downstream of the dam as if the dam were not there or if the dam had failed. And they require that you adopt and failure floodplain maps as part of your floodplain map. Um, this is just an example of the, this is the Blue Mound State Park, the dam on um, that's the river. Anyway, the dam failed. This was there was nothing this particular downstream of it was damaged, but it did uh, you know it had a major impact on the park. Uh, and I believe this was also so this is an example from Wisconsin of what they call the purple line is that hydraulic shadow, the area that is risked by inundation. Um, so the answer to the first question here is yes, the community does have the authority to regulate within that hydraulic shadow. Um, here's another sort of pop question. Do the uh, property owners in that hydraulic shadow have to purchase flood insurance? No, they don't because it's not it's not a FEMA requirement. It is a state requirement. And um, a, a related uh, local action that communities can take is to establish elevation, you know, base flood elevations for buildings that are outside of the map floodplain, but also in the flood prone area. Very common to have, you know, stormwater backups uh, during flood events. You've all seen how many of the roads, and many of the highways get flooded. Um, most of these areas are not mapped, but they can be mitigated. And once again, uh, property owners do not have to buy flood insurance, but they would have to then elevate their structures or otherwise. Where this is southern Minnesota, this is your new home, and just look at all the water in that landscape. This is kind of making the point that, you know, back when this area was first settled, probably 50% of it was wetland or some type of water body and had since been drained and ditched. And in, during this flood event, it was just reverting back to its original condition. 
So most of these areas would not be mapped. Uh, I'm going to skip these and I'm going to go to the natural functions because I don't want to take too much time. Um, you know, floodplains are natural systems, and often the way we manage them involves sort of straight jacketing them in culverts and uh, drainage ways. And, you know, even when they're uh, protected as open space, it's often not particularly natural open space. It might be kind of food or like, like golf course, for example. But, you know, these are dynamic systems. Uh, when you can allow change in a natural system, the habitat will bounce back and be restored. When it's changed through human activity, the habitat is, is permanently removed. So the kind of natural functions toolbox, and I do I do have a handout on this. Patrick, is this something you were able to send out to people? No, I didn't send it beforehand. I'll send oh. it after. Okay, well, we'll send it afterwards. We have about a five-page handout that goes into a lot of detail and gives some ordinance language examples for what some of these higher standards are, uh, uh, special needs. Um, buffering wetlands, maintaining infiltration and flood storage capacity, mostly by limiting impervious coverage, and then protecting the meander belt where one exists. Um, this is a little bit off base for floodplain, but it's a good example of wetland protection. Uh, which the city of Plymouth actually applies um, floodplain and shoreline setback requirements to most of their mapped wetlands. Um, the buffer strips vary the depending on the quality of the wetland, and then the structure setback to the buffer is 15 feet. Uh, so they did a real, they made a real concerted effort to not be these small areas that might be prone to flooding, but are generally not part of the you not find out what the We have a floodplain ordinance for the center for the shoreline. For when we use to create the shoreline. Are, are we trying to vary the floodplain ordinance to the shoreline from the shoreline to the floodplain? That's an interesting question. Some, some communities have tried to combine them. I guess from the DNR's perspective, uh, we just want each ordinance to have as high a standard as possible. I don't know that it's necessary to combine them uh, you know, in one document. But I, uh, on the other hand, you could certainly combine, for example, the definition section. Dan, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, well, I would agree with that, that comment. But in general, I think it's probably easier to keep them separate they are very different silos that we work in. Yes. Uh, I hate to use that as an excuse, but it, we, you know, especially from a flood protection standpoint, flood uh, insurance program is sort of nice to have a standalone. But they do tend to approach it from different angles in terms of you know, well, the regulations. Well, the more restrictive. More restrictive. Um, and there are provisions in the shoreline ordinance that deal with elevation, sure. and you know. If those are more restrictive than your floodplain, then that would prevail. Um, but if you are integrating the two documents, you might be able to remove the floodplain protection from the shoreline piece if it's adequately protected to a floodplain. So you could could uh, cut out areas to sort of keep to remove conflicts. That that's a possibility too. I guess another way to answer that is is that for your from your perspective, the easiest thing might be incorporate some of the shoreland protected elements into the floodplain, which would be more compliant to the ordinance. And you know, you'd be a good, you'd be a good uh, test case for us. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, guys, you guys need you to participate in the DNR. Oh, very awesome. Awesome. That's very awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Save your time? Yeah. Well, fine. So yeah. what, I'm sorry, one, one, one last question. I'm sure this has been brought up before. I remember you say that uh, the Merco rule that we're working on right now, is that going to be, can that replace be sufficient enough for our shoreline? That's a really good question. I'm going to let you answer. <laughs> I mean, we're obviously unique. I mean, I, I'm not proud of this, but we don't have a shoreline ordinance, but we've gotten away with it for years. Right. And 
I'm ready to <laughs> But we're coming to a point, you know, where uh, we're, now that we're working on the cop plan, we need to get to a work with our group. You know, yeah. We're going to have to do something. So do we need to provide, because I don't want to do a triple redundancy here. I mean, our club plan ordinance well, I don't know. I, I, I tend to think that you could combine shoreline provisions with your personal area. So those two are those much more aligned two. naturally than yeah. if you wanted to combine them. But uh, yeah. And uh, I, mean, they, I can talk about They that would more. fit very well into a single overlay district. And you would not need to do very much uh, to incorporate the shoreline. Because most of them are parallel. So, but again, floodplain is kind of a different animal. Um, this is an interesting example of habitat protection through a floodplain ordinance, where this is in Washington State. There was actually a lawsuit that charged uh, FEMA with not having good enough standards to protect salmon spawning habitat. And uh, this is a really good analogy to trout stream. Um, what do trout need? Another pop quiz to thrive. Cold water. Uh, and what's a contributing factor to the cold water? A lot of it's groundwater, but um, shade. Yeah, yeah. What plain ordinances do not address shading of trout streams? So this would be, I don't know if anyone is listening in from southern Minnesota, but this is a higher standard that I think, you know, I tend to suggest. Another thing that this ordinance does, this is a, you know, this is a big change, is that they have a meander channel migration area. And I'll, I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, one of the other really important things you can do, and many watershed districts do this, is to, if you're going to fill in the flood fringe, to require compensatory storage. Because what you're doing is you're taking away flood storage. And our state rules, which we would like to change, actually say, if you're going to build in the flood fringe, you have to fill um, 15 feet on all sides of the structure. I think the idea is that that's how you get access to it. But in a sense, that, that is a negative in terms of natural function. Um, limiting impervious coverage, and we'll talk about that under shoreland. Uh, Minnehaha Creek, they limit impervious coverage even more in the area that's closest to the stream. It's a 10 year floodplain, probably the floodway. And then the last thing I'll mention is that meander belt. Certain rivers have a very sinuous um, pattern, I guess it's just called the geomorphology. Um, the Vermilion River is one of them. And they did a study where they actually were able to track the meander patterns and create setbacks that are based on the area within which the riverbed could move. Um, there's another example of a meandering stream, one that crossed the county line and then it turned into a ditch on the other side. But that's another story. But this is a this is a great example of a river that did meander kind of drastically. Oh yeah, Garvin Brook is Garvin Brook, and it jumped about you know, several hundred feet, well outside of the map of floodplain, and he took out the rear yards of all the houses. So, so that's just an example of the stream doing what streams do if they're, if they're allowed to. Um, so a couple of summary slides. You can you can think about managing for the future floods. Here's the Alice 14 again by. Um, creating kind of a protective zone around your mapped floodplain that, you know, maybe people in this area don't need to buy flood insurance, but they are going to need to start thinking about future flooding. And you can also adopt better maps. Some of the FEMA maps, the uh, flood insurance rate maps, are actually not go back to it. Um, and this is an example where New London, City of New London in Canadoma County, Actually, DNR created a map that has much more detail 
flood elevation, again, based upon that LIDAR, and they adopted this as part of their program. And that's, that's something that other communities can do. So, a uh, quick summary, and I'm, I apologize for going late, but Brian, you went late too. Hand it over to Dan. decrease in water clarity, there's a 22% decline in property value. 
Uh, this research was conducted in the northern lakes rich part of the state. Don't know if these sort of relationships apply in more urbanized areas. But there's clearly an effect here that people who buy property um, are willing to pay more for property on clean, clean water bodies. And we all know that there's a strong connection between um, development and the nutrients that flow into our water bodies. So on the left panel here, we have an, a completely undeveloped piece of shoreland. We have in the middle sort of a historically developed piece, you know, a small north land cabin. And then we have more contemporary development. Uh, sorry, these slides sort of got squished a bit here, so they look a little um, awkward. But but in this natural environment, we have very low levels of, of runoff. Um, this is the red is volume, um, green is phosphorus, and, and brown is sediment. And so these are sort of a natural baseline level of, of, uh, of movement. On a small developed landscape, we have hardly any change in terms of stormwater runoff volume or phosphorus, but we start to see a four times increase in terms of sediment. And then on this more contemporary developed lot uh, where we've really removed most of the, all of the natural cover, at least in the near shore area. We have um, dramatic increases in certainly uh, sediment, but also in the amount of volume that runs off and, and phosphorus. Now sediment is, is it a, a regulated pollutant, pollutant in its own right, but it also is a, a great conduit for carrying um, mercury, heavy, other heavy metals, and, and phosphorus as well. So it, it's really um, a big pollutant that's causing a lot of problems in our lakes and rivers. And so you know, how we manage this, this near shore land development is extremely important. And I, I might want to man, mention too at this point that our shoreline program is really the only um, statewide program that tries to clearly connect land use with water quality. And this is part of the issue we have you know, with this disconnect that Brian mentioned earlier between water planning and land planning, is that there really is very little integration of those two um, uh, efforts. But the shoreland program, it's been around since uh, actually 1976 for counties, and still to this day remains the only real uh, program to try to bridge that gap. So uh, what the, the appeal that we're, we're making is, is for communities to try to better integrate land and water planning and to maybe even think of the shoreland program or your shoreland regulation as a, a jumping off point to sort of build on what's already here. Um, we know that people don't like regulations and don't want to add more of them, but can we work more comprehensively at least with the shoreland program and think about how can we do more with it? So just thinking about this issue here, um, if you're working with your city council, your planning commission, property owners, what's your best argument for preserving natural shoreline environments? What, what do you say when, when people write about the regulations or say that's overreached by the state or you know that's taken away my property rights? Uh, how do you talk to them about this issue? Property values. Property values. Water quality and property values. Anyone else? Any other sound bites that you like to use that you find are effective? Well, we found it actually it seems does tend to vary. And some some communities, we uh, because they have made such an effort to deal with stormwater and um, talking about low impact development, um, it really can talk about the filtering and slowing of runoff as a stormwater strategy. So it's sort of that engineering or technical perspective. You know, some communities really value that. So the city engineer knows it all, and the city engineer is in charge of, of runoff and, and infiltration. So that's a safe bet for some communities. Um, some communities, especially way up north, uh, it's the aesthetics um, that really play. You know, people want to have that northern exposure experience. That's really important. Um, and for other people, it's the water quality and how that affects the value of their property. So, again, um, we have this situation here. Clearly, we have an erosion problem. Um, how do you talk to your community about practices to prevent this sort of thing from happening? 
how would somebody here, how, how does anybody sort of approach this sort of problem? This is an occurrence in your, or it would be an occurrence in your community. Sorry, King. Yeah, this is a, actually a public park on the Mississippi River in Aiken County. Um, clearly, it's a, it's a classic park environment with turf grass. Um, no natural whatsoever. We'd also maintain that it, you know, it's sort of situational. Here we have um, a river that's prone to flooding, sort of on an outward bend of the river. This might be a good application for some riprap along with some natural revegetation to try to stabilize this bank um, with some human uh, intervention as well as trying to reinforce it with some natural intervention, with some natural landscaping plan. Okay, well let's do a brief review of the Shoreland program before we get into the, the project that I want to talk about. Um, we've seen this before. It's with all of our uh, programs. They start at the statutory or, or state laws. Then agencies like the DNR implement them. <clears throat> and then at the local level, we implement these through local ordinances. Looks like he's got points out shape here. I don't know in the translation. But anyway, it's this cascading effect. And um, in one of the ways that we try to administer this program is from model ordinances. This model ordinance has been changed since at least 1999 and probably earlier than that. And that's one of the main ways that we can help local governments um, adapt um, model uh, state rules to their local needs. So the uh, Statewide program includes all public waters. There was an inventory in the 80s that identified these both lakes and streams um, and given a shoreland classification. So this includes, if you're in a county, any water body greater than 25 acres or anything more than 10 acres in the city. And uh, as Suzanne mentioned, the wetlands classified as three, four, and five. These are the wetlands that typically have water in them. These are all classified with some designation from any or natural environment, which are as a classification given to water bodies that are most sensitive to human impacts, meaning that if uh, phosphorus or other nutrients move into these water bodies, their water quality is likely to decline quickly. Um, and then we have general development or GD lakes, which are generally deeper, larger, more resilient to human impacts. And then we have a similar but different classification for rivers. Um, this is a very small district. The Shoreland District is only a thousand feet from the water. It's on a lake or 300 feet from a river or the outer edge of a floodplain on a river. So you know, this is not the watershed we're talking about. This is a small piece of any watershed. But it's, it's a good place to start to think about watershed protection. And you know, who knows? Maybe in, in some dream down the road, uh, we, we start zoning by watershed, you know, instead of just having the limitations associated with the, the shoreland district of a thousand feet. Um, briefly, some of the key standards in the shoreland program are, are lot sizes, um, setbacks. Um, both these cases, we refer to these as dimensional standards, and these vary depending on lake classification. Um, there are much larger lot sizes required on sensitive natural environment lakes, smaller lot sizes on general development lakes, and there's also a corresponding difference with regard to setbacks. Um, we have some vegetation standards in the shoreland rules, but they're really about prohibiting cutting as opposed to establishing a desirable uh, proactive standard. So again, here's some opportunities for improvement. Um, we also have uh, in the agriculturally zoned areas a 50-foot um, buffer that is supposed to be maintained. And it's interesting the language in the, sh in the agriculture says that it should be maintained, whereas for um, all other buffer areas within, say, a GD district, it just talks about prohibitions on cutting. So there's slightly different language. And of course, uh, there may, will be some nuances on the agricultural buffer here as we begin implementing the new buffer legislation. But that's a separate topic. We also have some minimum standards dealing with land alteration and stormwater. The most important one here is the impervious surface limit of 25%. Many communities have adopted 
a lower standard than that. Um, and we'll talk about that a bit under the flexibility provisions and, and higher standards. Um, and uh, oh, this is crazy. Um, but I just want to briefly talk about our role in this program. We have a, a field staff that work with different communities throughout the state, and their job is to work with local governments when they adopt an ordinance for the first time to amend any of the shoreland ordinance provisions. Um, we do that through kind of communications. We'll review it for conditional and final approval at different stages in the hearing process or adoption process. Um, that's the most important thing that we do. We must review and approve any ordinance before it's effective. We also do weigh in from time to time when you variances or conditional use permits or approving large subdivisions. That's a discretionary activity for us, but area hydros make the call on whether they want to get involved or not. They may identify a serious problem with the project or a variance or a really big opportunity that they want to try to influence um, the local government to consider. So um, during this whole process, though, we do try to promote higher standards and, um, and ordinances, model ordinances. So, um, as you all know, we'd like to know at least 10 days before public hearing so that we can weigh in on comments for more time if possible. Um, and I just want to pause here a moment to talk about flexibility. Um, the Shoreland rules, even though they are uh, quite old, included a very nice provisions for flexibility. Primarily, they were intended to allow us to work with cities that have been developed over a long period of time, have established patterns of development to, to have some flexibility in some of these basic standards. So this is still the part of the rules that we can use in developing standards that are more custom for local units of government. And we have done this in a number of situations. Um, however, the expectation is if we're going to be flexible on one provision, we expect to see a higher level of performance on another provision. So um, some of the uh, examples. Um, a lot of counties have a desire for allowing more guest cottages or secondary dwellings. So we've worked with counties to do this um, in return for um, higher standards for, for vegetation and or restoration of vegetation whenever there's a permit for a guest cottage. Um, we have, uh, for some urban cities, um, allowed higher levels impervious surface in return for higher standards for volume um, reduction infiltration into the soil. And then also, um, Bemidji is a really good example where we allowed them to have higher um, impervious in density and height in certain areas, certainly in their downtown area, um, in return for less impervious surface and density elsewhere. And the city, in this case, has adopted some, some districts within their shoreland where they have higher lot size, larger lot sizes and 15% um, impervious surface coverage. So, there's been this, this opportunity to conduct some, some discussion and negotiation about what will work um, to allow cities to, to grow and develop, certainly to, to, um, to revitalize the downtown areas that are in Charlotte. Um, and so just briefly, as a local government, your responsibility is to let us know at least within 10 days of a public hearing when you're considering an amendment to your ordinance or any sort of discretionary activity like a variance land area. Um, and then also to administer the ordinance and to educate and explain it to, to property owners and to your council members and, uh, and to ask us for help if you need it. So let's uh, move on to this project here that uh, is sort of the centerpiece of what we're hoping to discuss with you. Um, first of all, this is not a rulemaking. <laughs> and I see glass. This is not a rulemaking, okay? <laughs> um, this is one of us. <laughs> this is not a rulemaking. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a voluntary effort on a number of fronts, and we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. But I really do want to emphasize this because um, we've had this history in the past where we've, we've done some voluntary standards uh, in the mid 2000s that sort of morphed into the last rulemaking effort. And there was a lot of concern, especially among counties, but many cities as well, that felt that um, you know, this was sort of a switch and bait type of thing. So uh, we just want to make clear that we are not intending to do any rulemaking around this issue. I think it's very 
clear to us that rulemaking isn't in the future for the shoreline program. So we're adopting this approach of how can we work with communities to get them to voluntarily adopt higher standards. Um, uh, briefly, just to, I want to put this in the context of the history of this program. Um, it started back in 1969 with the first Shoreline Act, and then following on the heels of that was the first rules for counties. The Act was amended in 73, adding cities, and then the first rules for cities came out in 76. And then in 1989, the rules were updated to have one set of rules for both cities and counties, and those remain the current set of rules. And someone mentioned earlier that a lot of cities have some difficulties with these rules because they seem to have been designed primarily for counties, and that's true. These rules do tend to work for counties or uh, more greenfield development. Really, we're not intended to work for cities that are redeveloping to have uh, an established development pattern. So we recognize that, and so that's why it's nice that we have this flexibility built into the rules to allow us to work with cities especially. Um, so in more recent time, as I mentioned, in 2005, the Central Lakes region and the DNR and many other interests worked on these voluntary shoreline standards. And this whole process, I think, really felt like a a lot of people sort of thought that's what was going on. It, um, but in 2007, the legislature then directed the DNR to update the rules, probably because they thought there was a lot of good work going on in this voluntary effort. Let's, let's just move this into the rulemaking process. Um, that was never the DNR's intent, um, but many people perceived it that way. Um, so after this, the DNR did embark on about a two-year process um, to update the shoreline rules. Um, Governor Pawlenty at the time um, returned those rules, did not want to, the state to adopt any more regulations, uh, certainly under his watch, and so this effort just stopped in 2010. Um, and so this is where we are today. Um, we, we don't anticipate any, uh, any new authority to make or update the rules. And so if anybody is still thinking that that's a possibility and is holding off on updating any of your ordinances, don't think that. Um, let's move ahead voluntarily. We can do that. Um, and so we want to develop some model ordinances to help you do that. I um, also just put a note in here that um, you know, people always talk about, well, how are we going to afford to do this? And this is where we want to make the connection back to water planning. I don't know if you remember that early slide that Brian showed that had these two sequences of planning going on. On one side was the land use. On the other side was the, the water planning. And so if you are engaged in water planning efforts, and if you can get a strategy put into that, either a plan or something known as the Watershed Restoration and Protection Strategies document or wraps, if you can get a strategy about updating a local shoreland ordinance to address you know, whatever the issue is, um, Bowser has indicated that they're very interested in funding that sort of activity. Now, of course, Actual funding will depend on the other priorities that come out of that same plan. But uh, that is one source of money available for communities to update or adopt for the first time a shoreline ordinance. So um, why would we want to update this model? Well, first of all, uh, since 19, it was first developed in 1989, probably slightly updated in 1999. Um, the world has changed. Uh, we have a number of statutes that have changed since then that we want to reflect in this model. First of all, in 2007, the legislature added additional protections uh, for the continuation of resorts that have nonconformity structures in them. We have a huge update to the nonconformities language in 2009 that really does um, make a lot of the shoreline rule language irrelevant. And that language is still in the model. We need to update the model to reflect those changes. And as you know, the variance um, criteria and statute for both cities and counties was substantially changed in 2010. Uh, the shoreland rules still have old language talking about hardship and other things like that. So again, we want to clean up the model ordinance document to make it relevant for today. There's also been changes on other agency rules that interact 
with the shoreland rules. For example, um, PCA has updated their um, septic system standards and their feedlot standards over the years, um, which affects how the shoreland rules interact with them. And then Bowser's also updated um, WACA regulations concerning wetlands. So, to, again, some cleaning house, making sure that the, the model is consistent with today's standards. Um, but we also know that the model ordinance is, is difficult to implement, and there are certain provisions that are very cumbersome. Um, planned unit development for subdivisions in shoreland areas is highly complex. And in, in fact, this is an area that's really ripe for higher standards if you choose to adopt higher standards. Um, the embedded standards in rules and the model allow an ex extreme levels of density in the shoreland area. It, it's sort of an unfortunate, you know, especially for an agency and a set of rules that's trying to protect your land areas. Um, the density provisions here are, are astronomical if you do some things. So we, we, this is an area ripe for higher standards. But there's also a lot of provisions that deal with land use districts that are very dated and cumbersome, difficult to implement, perhaps not even needed um, in the model. Um, and another example is dealing with controlled access lots. The language and the formulas are very complex very difficult for um, cities to administer, especially smaller cities with a very small staff. And can't see this, but also we see the, the opportunity here to update the model ordinance as a, a great way to, as a vehicle for introducing higher standards. And this is where, where you come in. Um, we don't know exactly what this product will look like yet. Uh, most likely it will be a fully digital product that we'll have on our website with a lot of links from, say, veg the vegetation minimum standards to a series of recommendations for higher standards. So we think that cleaning house editing this basic model ordinance document is a great vehicle for launching into very different, a clearinghouse, if you will, of higher standards. So that's what we're doing here. So ultimately, what we want to accomplish here is we want something that's more used and useful for local governments. We hope that more cities will adopt an ordinance. There are many cities that haven't adopted one yet. Um, for cities and counties that have one, we hope that they will adopt higher standards. And then lastly, um, we hope there's an opportunity here for greater ownership. And this is where talking about the um, maybe some flexibility, maybe creating some special templates for cities with special circumstances might help create more ownership. So at this point, we've been thinking about this project in two phases. The first phase is really the editing or cleaning house phase. It, you know, it's sort of a, a process where we can look at how can we reorganize this document, rewrite it with plain language, maybe replace some complicated processes with some simplified formulas, um, reorganize it a bit. And then the next phase is what kind of higher standards can we develop and learn from counties and cities that have already done some of this stuff. And then a third phase might be coming in with the basic model cleaned up and creating a template that might, you know, uh, be shoreland for urban areas uh, or shoreland for highly sensitive areas. Um, some templates that could be useful for cities when they come in wanting to update their ordinance. So here's where we'd like involvement from you and this is where we'd like to have some discussion. Um, you know, what, what ideas do you have for higher standards um, and, and how would you implement them? There are many different ways to implement regulations in a zoning code. But of course we're interested in standards that maintain or protect water quality, maintain habitat, and also retain the aesthetic qualities that are appropriate for a given uh, community, or maybe try to restore some aesthetic character that may have been lost over the years. Thinking that perhaps then maybe a small group that comes out of this group would be interested in reviewing and commenting on draft standards that we've developed, um, you know, giving us your perspective perhaps on how this might or might not work, um, as well as ideas for how to communicate and promote. And again, I think three steps cities would be a really nice place to promote some of these standards when we finish this project. And sort of to, to think about this, 
you know, here's a, a sort of a template for a menu of higher standards. Um, we have topical areas that address water quality, habitat, and aesthetics. These are things like vegetation management, maybe soil water, surface, surface, maybe lot size. Um, those are the sort of content or topical areas. But then, how do we implement these? Are these things that we established as a uniform standard throughout the, the whole shoreland area? Are these things that maybe only pertain to a specific area? Um, are these things that might be implemented um, at the time of new development only, or only through a variance, maybe through a building permit? Some of these things might be applied. Some communities, Crow Wing County um, has taken the lead in a lot of these areas in that any time there's a permit required for building, land alteration, whatever, there's an assessment of vegetation. And before they can get their permit, they need to implement the results of that assessment. So if the assessment shows that they have a great shoreland buffer, no work is needed. If, if they don't meet the standard, then maybe they have to leave a certain strip of land as a no mow buffer. If they don't have a, if they have too much impervious surface, something over 15 percent, they have to look at a stormwater management program. So they, they implement these standards at the time of permitting. So it's a very comprehensive program. It's, it's an option. Um, of course, Crowing County, um, their lifeblood is in the water quality, the economic value that their um, shoreline properties bring in. So they have very strong incentive to maintain the quality of their shoreline. So there's, a, there's two ways of thinking about this. I think it's very important for us to understand as local administrators what's practical to apply. How can you administer this standard or that standard effectively? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the, the topical standards of, of habitat and um, the tied to administration, I think you know, we're, we're missing something that has been talked about. Um, are. We can all implement um, stronger standards, but to try to inspect or to create um, a sort of a toolkit of along this stretch of, of waterway, some kind of grant program. Oh, K wants canoes. Yeah, I can see that. That's probably true. <laughs>
but we we also we're trying to keep this effort sort of manageable. We don't we also are very cognizant about this effort being perceived as a rulemaking too. So we we're trying to keep the the, the involvement focused and and really on target with administration. So this is part of the the reticence maybe to really embrace this and turn this into a larger project because we've had some serious problems with people perceiving this is much more than this. this is not a rulemaking. We, we really want to keep it focused. So, um, so for this slide here is really intended to think about maybe even doing some brainstorming at this point in terms of you have ideas that you, you, you've seen or that your community has um, or are there strategies for implementation that you have thought works pretty well for your community. You know, and, and maybe a discussion needs to revolve around this idea of flexibility. Most of you have worked with the Shoreline program to some extent. You know, as we said, that Shoreline ordinances were designed primarily to develop land. Um, what are the ideas that you might have for better standards or you know, areas that are really tough for cities, especially, to implement. And, and you know, if you like this idea, but maybe or don't want to get to engage in this group, are you interested in taking this discussion offline? You know, to have maybe a few meetings to get into the weeds a bit more on these particular things here. We really like to get your your ideas, kind of play around with them, organize them a bit have you react to something that we put together um, and maybe work with us through a few sessions to help develop some standards that work better for cities. That, that's sort of our invitation to, to help us um, modernize the model ordinance and, and create perhaps some templates that really address cities unique needs. Yeah. Um, you know, I was just thinking about Kane's comment. I can, I can certainly see that Hearing from the perspective of the city, how you interact with them, there's so many tensions. So where the, I mean, depending on the context, state wise, I'm sure, and obviously it's depends on the shoreline or the floodplain. So, but it's really from the perspective of the city, how do you how do you deal or not deal with some of these things? would be a, a super helpful feedback to create in the process as a How we wrestle with Yeah. I'd like to on the cities here, I'm interested in this kind of need for flexibility. Is there anything that comes to mind um, in your cities about things that you wish were flexibility that you wish was written into the shoreland uh, ordinance that would give you kind of address problems you might have had in terms of redevelopment or existing developed areas or um, particular projects? I, I was involved very, very project uh, a fully developed community downtown was right on the river and they wanted to do downtown um, redevelopment and they encountered significant problems for you know, in how they from how they made their downtown vital and address the needs of the citizens while also meeting shoreland rules. Shoreline rules weren't designed for that level of density. I mean, that's the kind of thing in terms of flexibility that I'm, you know, has anybody encountered something like that? Does anybody here represent a, a small town that just on a river, maybe, that, that has a very limited number of resources? Anybody that's listening in um, that fits that category? Because um, that would be, you know, that's a, is our. You think about the universe of cities out there. We have a large number of cities that don't have shoreline ordinances and happen to be on a river. They were 
they were fairly low priority to begin with, and so the DNR didn't make an initial effort back in the day to require them to update an ordinance. But, but as these cities on rivers, you know, expand too, they're expanding into areas that um, are previously protected under the county ordinance. And as these cities annex and grow, there's no protection for them. And we'd like to develop something that is easy and directive and focused on their particular resource, which is in most cases just a river. So, you know, how could we do that and, and do that in a way that works? And so we'd, we'd like to work with a community that, that fits that description to be part of this process. That's not to say that we don't want to work with other cities too, but we've noticed that that is one big gap that we have in the shoreline program. Not here anymore. Well, we're, we're looking for ideas that that um, that would work for cities that are developed. If you've got developed land already, um, you want to work within that developed context. It's difficult to apply a standard undeveloped area to a developed area. And in that case, we do have in the rules actually a, a, what we call a setback averaging provision already that, that does allow some flexibility. It, it's in the rules, but is it, is it in the rules? Well, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure it is. I, I can't remember if it is in there. It's a, it's a pretty important piece of the rules. It would be a shame if it didn't get in there, but <laughs> but I'll have to look. I, yeah. I think it's there, but, you know, maybe it isn't. Yeah. Okay. Ideas, just pretty putting out their ideas for people to consider because all they know is maybe turf. Yeah. You know, and um, DNR did produce, I think, a very nice series of guides for shoreland probably about 10 years ago. And they address a lot of those issues. They address things like, you know, how do I know that you might have to and how do I do each thing and how do I? Yeah. 
No, you're right. The, the whole, trying to increase the number of, of images, both graphics or photographs, positive imagery is, is really important. Um, and uh, we, we've tried to do that a bit in the Merca rule uh, to incorporate some more visuals into that rule, actually. But, but for the model ordinance, I, I agree with you. The, the idea of incorporating visuals um, and trying to then maybe create links from the model you know, as sort of a table of contents to guidance that talks about some of these in more depth. And, uh, but yeah, I think you're right, Susan. Probably some of the <coughs> older documents that we have could be updated for um, use in this context as well. Yeah, yeah I think that's a great, that's a great point. Uh, the visual image. Getting to your issue, I'd say, how do we, how do we change the ordinance in order to address this better? And I think that's a great idea. More and more as we do see ordinances develop, they, they include much more visual references, and there are none in the, in the sample ordinance now. Exactly. Um, and uh, and incorporating those into the sample ordinance would I think give people a, a great deal of, of guidance, and and also. It may also enter some controversy, but that's okay, and you know, in terms of kind of asking for that flexibility. I mean, when I've helped counties or cities with with uh, shoreland rules, and they they say, you know, must must be visible in leaf on conditions or something like that. You know, it's like, well, what does that really look like? Um, providing some, just changing the, incorporating some examples visually into the into the sample ordinance would be very helpful, I think, to people, and it would also provide you know our staff with a bright line. About what, where, you know, um, they look to somebody has violated or not violated, right. or made a, you know, a conditional use permit that they shouldn't have, kind of that guidance as well. Because these standards, one of the things that when we talk about improving regulations, we we always want to make sure that it's not just the people who are being regulated that we want to help. We also want to help the people who are enforcing the regulations, so that both sides of the counter in the development process are using the same expectations. Um, and I think the visual references can help. Well, it's not that. So I mean, back to like the meat versus person center. It's just one more time. Something's going wrong. I'm bluffed and then somebody from Brooklyn Center can do a reference for you to say to them. Yeah. So, 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 so DNR sponsored canoe trips. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think the, the, the idea of having some visuals is really helpful. I know that the, the administrators all the time are, you know, you're faced with somebody on the other side of the counter and you, you've got some of these vague words in the text and it's like, well, what does this mean? Well, here are some examples of what we need, you know, and it, it does help set the bar um, when we can look at something. It's still subjective, but it's less subjective and it's easier to say something more definitively when you're talking to somebody who maybe doesn't want to hear what you're telling them. Maybe somebody who is really looking for better direction. So it, it, it can help in a variety of applications. I, I think that's a really great idea. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, as part of this update, what, what we're trying to do is, you know, is create through this process, you know, a, a new web presence that really Brings all this kind of into the 21st century, in, in you know, in terms of how people can access this, in terms of the actual model itself, but also as a table of contents or clearinghouse to find guidance or better language, actually better regulatory language, should they want to go that route. So that's that's really what we're trying to accomplish at the end of the day here. But but you know, we work at the state, even though we, some of us have worked at the local level. Um, you know, we don't have to face nowadays the, you know, or your decision makers or your property owners too. So we need to hear from you as to, you know, how do we need to frame some of these this guidance material? How do we need to sort of adapt some of the implementation strategies in ways that can really work in your communities? Because we we don't want to just you know be in our sort of ivory tower, if you will, and say here are some great ideas. And everyone looks at it and goes, well, yeah, that's pie in the sky. That's never going to work. That's why that's why we really need a local perspective. Do you want to say something about the uh, possible funding options for something? You mean like through wraps or something yeah. like that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mentioned that earlier, but I'll um 
you know, there is this this big water planning. Um, actually, I think I might in the have this slide here. We have this. Any of you, since you're really just working in cities and aren't engaged beyond it, you're probably maybe not really aware of this enormous effort in time and money that's going on in the state. Um, so PCA and Bowser are primarily leading these efforts here. But um, on a 10-year cycle, and a, and a, they call it a Chuck 10, Chuck 8, I'm, I'm really bad with numbers. Um, the major watershed, Huck 8 scale, they're doing all this kind of lake monitoring, river monitoring, and assessment, sort of a lot of technical characterization and problem investigation. But these technical issues are coming together in these documents called the draft, watershed restoration and protection strategy document. It's intended to synthesize all this very technical information into a document that the average person can read and understand. And this then is supposed to be used as input for developing water plans. Doing it, it's supposed to go to the public county. If this part of the state is first adapted into one watershed, one plan, then they're doing watershed planning at the game scale. So it's, it's a, there's a lot of things go moving part in this whole water planning cycle that's changing. But what, what's really important is that you get a strategy here that talks about you know, the city of Ohio, that's like black. Um, should adopt or revise your shoreline ordinance to address blah blah. If it gets in here, it's eligible for funding um, Bowser. Or if it gets in the watershed plan too. You know, either place, Bowser will look at this as a funding opportunity. That's on still is Edina. Oh. <laughs> Cartel was on earlier. Yeah, right. they were on earlier. Okay, okay. You might want to. They probably need to do more And we can help with that, I think, with the search team a little bit. And, and through the Green Set Cities, there's a listserv. So getting, getting that out. If you have a specific kind of request for you know support or something that we can send out. I think we can figure out how to get it out there. Great. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll leave some help in reaching out to try to bring people in. So great. Thank you. Yeah. But I think regardless, so I think even if you're locally, if, you, if your watershed district is amenable to amending your shoreland ordinance, which I can't see why they wouldn't be, um, if it gets into their water plan, um, it's, it's a great place then to seek funding. Because Bowser won't fund anything unless it's in like a watershed plan or your local water plan. So, but if it's in there, it, it, it's a very um, good potential to be funded. Yeah, I, and I really like the idea of trying to merge somehow the critical um, critical area planning with the shoreland because that's both those overlap so much and, and it really, you know, to do an integrated piece, I think would be to a, a model for other people to use that would be applicable in other places other than the, the Communities where it's going on right now. So, well, we know one of the um, the uh, whenever when, when, once once we get to the implementation phase of the Merca rules, after we finish the Merca rules, uh, developing model ordinances is, is a big part of that project. And so that would be an opportunity to think about how could we for those communities that have both shoreland and Merca, how they they could be merged together. And, and what what is what's the time frame for that process? Well, <laughs> oh, sorry, maybe I should have asked that. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 yeah. By, by mid next year, we should be done with the rule making okay. piece, and then we'll go into the implementation piece. And there's a, at least a year of DNR getting our ducks in a row before we actually roll anything out to them. So. Uh, just one last question Is this a rule making? <laughs> I, I heard him say it. No. Everyone together. No. No. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, can we just maybe uh, think about next steps here? We'll work with mm -hmm. with with uh, um, Diana, Diana, and and, and uh, Philip in maybe some way to 
reach out to the members to see if we can, yeah. you know, entice some involvement in this effort, and maybe we can work with you to sort of clarify maybe what some of the steps would be so that cities can understand a bit more what we're asking for. Yeah, yeah. and so I'll pass out some evals um, just for the workshop in general. But on the back, are interested in participating or learning more from Dan or just being on the list that you can reach out to specifically on um, next steps and um, details on participation with this. You can send to that on the back and we'll get that to Dan then. Okay, thank you. Did you, is the webinar still running, Patrick? Thanks, that's all we have. Don't forget next month, December 8th. Um, it's a great workshop that's been in the planning since the summer. Um, the Division of Energy Resources at the uh, Commerce Department is working with MINTAP to talk about opportunities for energy and water savings at um, wastewater treatment plants. So there's, they're doing a lot of work with that. And there'll be a couple follow-up um, workshops after that. So they're really you know, working on looking at all the opportunities um, to save energy through wastewater treatment. How many cities have their own wastewater treatment? That's very friendly. So please tune in, share with others that you might know. If you have networks um, in your region with other cities, you know, share it with them. Um, we do this to really, you know, help get that information out there. Thank you very much. <laughs>